Good afternoon and welcome to BizTech's Personal Finance Show. Many of us are very risk averse, but we want safe investments that we can hold for the long haul to help us build wealth. But putting money in fixed deposits is never a good thing, especially because inflation will erode our wealth. And at the same time, on the other side of the equation, which is very common in Asia, property is a, a big favorite, but it's a very illiquid asset class. Now, equities have been a proven way to build wealth over the long term. And value investing is a strategy that most people may find comfort in if they are patient and have a long term view. Now, here to give us the 101 on value investing is our guest today, David Kuo, the founder of the Smart Investor in Singapore. David, thanks for coming on the show. You're welcome, Brian. Uh, and let me just say, first of all, I mean, that was a great introduction from you, but people need to realize that if you want the returns, you have to take the risk, right? There is no such thing as uh, returns without risk. If you want to do that, then put the money under your mattress or go out and buy some of those 10-year treasuries and you can earn uh, 1% on US 10-year treasuries for the next 10 years. If you're happy with 1% a year for 10 years, go right ahead, be my guest. But if you need more than that, you're going to have to take some risk. Now, David, okay, then from, for a start, help us out here. Make the distinction between investing and trading. Okay, right. Investing is for the long term. Trading is for the short term. So ultimately, what you are doing if you are investing is you look at a company in much the same way as if you were uh, a business owner. You don't actually sort of build a business and say, I'm going to sell it tomorrow. You build a business for the very long term. So regardless of what kind of business you are going to be running, whether it is a hawker store selling me pop, or whether it is something far more uh, elaborate, such as a manufacturing company, you are looking for the long term. And that is the similar uh, concept you should have when you are investing. Trading, on the other no. hand, is the, yes. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Please go yeah. ahead, David. Okay. Yeah. Trading, on the other hand, is just simply saying, I think this is going to go up in price. So therefore, I'm going to put some money in that. And when it does, I jump out. And uh, I think Warren Buffett once said that the stock market is such a great place to leave your money. Why would you want to jump in and out of the market constantly? And traders need to remember that if you're going to be jumping in and out, somebody's going to be making money out of you. And that is the brokers who are going to be making their commission from you. So um, for me, it is long-term investing. I spend a lot of time looking for good companies that I will be able to hold forever, Brian. That is my time span, forever. Okay, now, so now let's define value investing. Okay, well, value investing is one of many disciplines that people can have. I personally am an income investor. So I look for companies that will reward me by paying me a dividend over the very long term. So I am a hardcore income investor. But apart from that, you also have growth investors, people who say that I don't really care too much about the income side. I don't care if the company doesn't pay me any dividends at all. I'm looking for the growth prospects of these companies. So consequently, you have people that go and look for fast growing companies like Apple, for instance. I mean, that's a fast growing company and it also pays you a dividend. So um, you can straddle two uh, disciplines. You can straddle, straddle income investing and growth investing. And you can say this is a fast growing income stock. Value investing is slightly different. Value investing is when you look in the market and you say, Something has happened to the share of this company. It's fallen. I think it's unreasonably fallen. And so therefore, I'm going to pick up these shares and exploit the fact that the market has mispriced this asset. And when the asset price goes back up again to what you think is fair value, then you can get out of that, um, get out of that stock. Now, what makes a great value stock? I mean, what are the key thing metrics and, and, and traits that you look for? Okay, uh, well, uh, there is a general uh, mnemonic that you can use, and it's called PYAD, P-Y-A-D. And what you're looking for is a price-to-earnings ratio that is less than two-thirds of the market P-E. So if the market P-E was, say, 21, and two-thirds of that is 14, uh, you would say that anything that was less than 14 would therefore be a value stock. And 
the next acronym, well, the next letter in the acronym is Y, which stands for yield. So you're looking for a company that will be able to pay you some kind of dividend whilst you're waiting for the value to be altered. Then you have A, which stands for assets. And what you're looking for is a company that's got a price to book ratio of less than one. So uh, if a price to book is one, it means that the company is fairly valued. If it's less than one, then it means that somebody has mispriced something. And the D in Payat stands for debt. What you really want to do is to look for a company that has little or no debt whatsoever, because it is debt that kills a company. You can have a company with a very low PE that pays a yield, uh, that also has a price to book that is less than one, but is carrying a shed load of debt, which therefore means that at some point in time, the lender is gonna say, can I have my money back? I don't care if your PE is low. I don't care if your, your yield is uh, reasonable. I don't care if your price to book is less than one. You owe me money. And if you owe me money, I want it back. And if you can't pay me back, I'm going to take the company over. So you want a company that's got no debt. So those are the four things that people should be looking at. P, Y, A, and D. That's an interesting uh, 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 traits to look for. But where do we find these stocks? Uh, hard work, Brian. Yes, you could. <laughs> it's, it's not going to suddenly appear in front of you like a mirage. You're going to have to look in the market and look for companies that have fallen in value, or if you have the ability to um, subscribe to certain uh, data providers, you can actually draw out all of that data, put them into a spreadsheet, and look for those companies and rank them in terms of their PE ratio and say, this one has got a rel relatively low PE ratio compared to the market. This one's got a high yield. And the thing is, if you look in the market, you're not going to be able to find value shares all the time because the, there is no situation where all the companies are going to be trading on a PE of uh, less than the market average. So uh, you have to wait, you have to wait your, your, your turn. And then when those stocks arrive, then you can say, I can then perform, perform my screen, I can do my fundamental analysis, and you might just find one or two of those companies that will fulfill those criteria. Now, David, how can I learn more about value investing? Now, uh, you know, you run the Smart Investor. Uh, that's just, can you tell us a little bit more about it? And, uh, you know, how, how, how do I uh, take advantage of your research? Well, um, yes, you're absolutely right, Brian. I mean, uh, we have a website called the smartinvestor.com.sg. And amongst us, we have um, value investors. We have income investors, such as myself. We have growth investors. And each person has a, se a separate discipline. And what you do is you uh, come to our website, have a look, identify the person who is either income, growth, or value, and look for that person and read what that person says. And you have to you have to learn. And what I really want to say to people is that if you are just starting out investing, you will not know what kind of discipline actually suits you. I have to say, when I first started out, I was pretty much a growth investor, and I like the idea of growth because um, I just wanted to get rich quickly. Uh, but then I found that uh, growth investing didn't really suit my personality. Then I tried value investing, and I thought, no, that's not for me either. Then I hit upon income investing, and I thought, for some reason, it's, it, it's almost as though you found the best friend ever. And you go, I understand income investing, I love income investing, and that is the discipline that I have followed ever since I found it. So, uh, yes, by all means, come to our website, have a look, and uh, read what uh, different writers have to say, and you'll soon quickly identify who are the income, growth, and uh, value investors. Now, why should we invest in value stocks versus something else, or value or income stocks versus something else that everyone is buying? For example, today, the flavor of the month or flavor of the last few months has been glove makers or tech stocks. After all, David, people are making a lot of money on these stocks right now. Well, uh, I, it's interesting that you mentioned glove makers because um, just recently uh, the share price of a couple of the big uh, Malaysian glove makers have fallen quite significantly. And uh, you are more than welcome to go and have a look at those stocks and just say that have they been unfairly punished by the market? And why have they been unfairly punished by the market? And you may actually find opportunities there. And I think the same goes for uh, growth stocks, tech stocks. You can have a look at the technology companies. And I remember a couple of years ago, uh, there was one very popular tech stock called NVIDIA. 
and its share price fell very significantly. And then there were lots of people that said, tell you what, there's actually value in there now, so therefore let's go in and buy. And the same goes for Apple. Occasionally, Apple stocks will fall. And if you have a look at Apple, yes, the PE ratio is not excessively low, but it still pays a dividend. And so therefore, even amongst the tech sectors, you can find value. And I know I mentioned, first of all, about uh, the acronym PYAD, P-Y-A-D. But there is another way in which you can uh, value a stock, and that is uh, by having a look at the dividends that it pays you over the long term and discount them to today's price. And you can say that based on my analysis, I think that if I buy the stock today, it is undervalued based on the dividend cash flow uh, that the company will generate for me. So there are different ways in which uh, we can have a look at value. And just because it is a tech stock doesn't mean that there isn't value there, Brian. Okay. I'm sure some of our viewers would want some tips on how to start off in terms of a key, uh, a couple of key stocks. Maybe let's start with, for example, some value stocks that you are holding in Bursa, Malaysia. Could you share some of the, the stocks that you have and why you hold them? Okay. Well, uh, I have a 20 stock Malaysian portfolio. In other words, I went in there and I picked uh, what I would consider to be the best 20 companies in Malaysia for my portfolio. And one of those companies is something, well, it's a company that many of your listeners may be familiar with. It's called Allianz Malaysia. It's an insurance company and it insurance operates company. in Malaysia. It's probably one of the biggest insurers in Malaysia at the moment. And it does household and, and personal and all kinds of life insurance and annuities as well. If you have a look at this company at the moment, uh, the P-E ratio is around five or six. And if you, if you have a look at the Malaysian market, wow. I know, yeah. <laughs> it, well, I, really? you know, there is value there, isn't there, yeah? Yes. And then you have a look at the P-E for the Malaysian market, it's around 20, isn't it? Yeah, so this is trading yeah. at a significant discount to the uh, P-E for the Malaysian market. It also pays a dividend. It's got a, a dividend yield of around 4%. Price to book is around 0 0.8, 0 0.9, so it's less than one. And of course, um, debt doesn't really matter so much for insurance companies. So you can relax that sort of debt rule for the insurance companies, just as you can relax the debt rule for banks, because it doesn't really apply. So you look at this company, you go, right, it's got a PE of around five or six, it's got a dividend yield, and it's actually got a price to book of less than one. Do I think this is a value stock? Yeah, pretty much so. Do I think the PE at some point will actually rise to uh, close to the market average? Yeah. Uh, and in the meantime, I'm collecting my 4% dividend yield as I'm waiting for the PE to be oh. altered. And I'm also sort of waiting for the price to book to actually go back up to one, if not beyond. So that is a an example of um, a value stock that is sitting inside my uh, Malaysian portfolio, which is also rewarding me in terms of income whilst I wait. Now, how about uh, some examples of value stock holdings on the SGX? Well, I think good examples in the Singapore market would be the banks. If you have a look at uh, OCBC, for instance, and that currently is on a PE of around 12, whereas the Singapore market is on a PE of about 21, 22 at the moment. So it's about half the valuation of the Singapore market. And you would say, in that sense, I would say it isn't that expensive. It's also got a dividend yield of about 4%, and it's got a price to book of less than one. So that would be another example of how the market has unfairly treated uh, the banks. And they say that, oh, we, because we have an economic downturn, banks are going to get hit very badly. So therefore, I'm going to sell the banks. And that's what people really did at the beginning of uh, 2020 when the pandemic hit. They panicked, they sold out, and that was when I, I stepped in and I bought. And so gradually, uh, I'm, I'm beginning to see the value being outed in OCBC, but that isn't the only bank. You also got UOB that is on similar valuations and DBS as well, Brian. Now, thank you very much for that, but any final sagely words of wisdom, David? Well, I don't know about sagely, but I mean, this is, this is words of wisdom, I think, uh, from any long-term investor to anyone that is starting out investing today. And that is um, something that Warren Buffett was asked many, many years ago uh, when somebody said to him, Warren, if you are such a smart investor, why don't people copy what you do? 
And then Warren Buffett smiled, and then he looked at the person and he said, it is because people don't like to get rich slowly. People like to get rich quickly. And investing is all about getting rich slowly and enabling what you've actually picked to last you for the very long term. And that is why Warren Buffett also said that his favorite holding period is forever. And so if, if, if you are a long-term investor, you have to embrace those two concepts. The first one is that you're not going to get rich overnight. And secondly, that you're going to have to hold your stocks for the long term in order to reap the benefits of uh, the company as it grows over time. And some of my stocks, Brian, are so old, they've got beards, right? I mean, I've got, I've got, <laughs> I've got companies like Unilever, which I've held ever since I first started investing. And it's still wow. with me today, and it's still rewarding me today, just as it did over 20 years ago. Thank you very much for your insights, David. You're welcome, Brian. Thank you, and Happy New Year to you. Yes, Happy New Year. And we've been speaking to David Kuo, founder of The Smart Investor in Singapore on Bistec's Personal Finance Show. I'm Brian Fernandez. Check out www.bistec.asia for business and technology conversations.